whole concept. Great. Well, well, as I said, welcome to this evening's session. It's um, getting ready for ELM. And in particular, we're looking at the sustainable farming incentive uh, on the Moreland standard. And um, this evening's uh, session is being hosted by the Foundation for Common Land together with the Federation of Cumbria Commoners. And it's made possible through the support of the Heritage Fund and our other partners who are um, through the project, Our Upland Commons. First off this evening, um, Alan Robinson, who's project officer for Our Upland Commons for the Lake District is going to be telling us a little bit, giving us an introduction to the work he's been doing so far after over the last few months. And then we'll get into the, um, the, the talk I'll be giving. Alan, do you want to quickly run through the agenda? Oh, no problem. So hello everyone, um, good to see you all this evening. Um, just very quickly to go through the, the agenda. Um, <clears throat> we are um, we're going to start off with a very brief overview of the uh, Our Upland Commons project for those that, that aren't already aware of what we're up to. Um, we'll then have, have Judy going through the, the, the getting ready for, for Elm session. Um, then go into some breakout rooms between between 10 and 12 people per per room uh, that'll be facilitated by the the federation and then going coming back to have a bit of a a bit of a summary of of, of what we were talking about in the breakout rooms before a, a quick q a session and um, please do make sure that you answer ask any questions by typing in the chat uh, along the way and we'll answer those at the end or if uh, you prefer to just ask a facilitator when you go into the breakout rooms please do that as well um, or any other way that you see fit, please do get them to us for the Q&A at the end of the session. <clears throat> so very briefly, um, a quick overview on uh, our common cause, our Upland Commons. So as Julie mentioned, it's a national lottery uh, heritage funded project, uh, a national project focused on the Lake District, the Yorkshire Dales, the Shropshire Hills and, and Dartmoor National Park. Um, there are 25 uh, partner organisations um, nationwide um, in terms of a few of those in the lakes, they include the Federation of Cumbria Commoners, uh, the National Park, the National Trust, um, Cumbria Wildlife Trust, among, amongst many others as well, including Friends of the Lake District, um, John Muir, and, and lots of others. Now, the three lakes, the, the three commons in the Lake District that we're focusing our efforts on are, are Bampton, uh, Kinneyside, and Derwent, all very specific commons with, with very different um, aspects but all very interesting to be working on and trying to trying to um, trying to make a bit of a difference with the, with the funding that we have. So what is um, our Uplands Commons? Um, the overarching theme of, of, of our Uplands Commons is around how we can conserve and enhance uh, the heritage of commons and commoning uh, in Upland, Upland England, how we can keep commoning alive and, and, and going on um, as we go through these changes that we're having currently. And there's four central aims, uh, collaboration in terms of how we can help people work together, whether that be commoners, landowners, and, and other bodies. Um, how can we enable a common to thrive and, and um, for all parties involved in a common to, um, to sustain a common and, and, and keep that going um, as we move through some of these, these challenging times. Uh, resilience focuses on um, how we can prepare for change, but also take the opportunities that, that come up from this change. There are lots of opportunities and we want to be able to, to show those and, and um, take advantage of those where we see fit. Um, commons for All uh, is about reconnecting the public. And, and for me, it's really about shouting about what Commons offer, what they offer to the general public, from water quality to, to carbon storage and sequestration, through to, to being an open space, which I'm sure lots of people have have, um, have benefited from over the last 12, 18 months in particular. And then Commons for Tomorrow, the, the final theme is all about how we enhance the environmental and ecological benefits of, of these commons and, and show that value, show the value of commoning as, as a part of that. So we have quite a few different projects that we're currently working on in the lakes. Um, I think it shows a really good um, 
a really good sort of broad range of what's happening and, and what we got what you're getting on with. Um, in terms of, of habitats and public goods, we're trying to identify and map habitats and public goods, working on uh, building on some of the work that's already been carried out um, with some of the test and trials. What we're looking to do is show what's present on a common, but also how habitats have improved or changed over time. Uh, this being farmer led work wherever we can. This also links into to bracken management, particularly on, on Derwent Common and, and how we can improve grazing, but also as a, as an, as a, as an, as a benefit as well, have uh, an increase wildlife benefits as well of improving triple SI condition, how we can take grazing pressure away by managing bracken and increasing the habitat as a whole. Um, <clears throat> one of the flagship projects on Kinneside is around carbon and carbon footprinting, adapting a carbon calculator so it can be fit for use on a common and a commoning system. Um, as, as everyone on here will probably be appreciate, uh, a common comes within by land and they have to work together practically. They also have to work together from a carbon perspective. And that's what we're really trying to, to understand and, and focus on how that can, how that can work and, and showing that, that benefit. Uh, Flock Health will be uh, a project looking over all, all of the, the commons and looking at identifying key health issues that aren't currently being, ex being explored and, and find solutions to these through working together and creating action plans and management plans over in the common scape as a whole. I think fi finally looking at commons and commoning and how we talk about them. Um, there's some really exciting work looking at archaeological surveys, uh, how we look at, at what's there, what's been there in the past, uh, promoting commons through the John Moore Awards to, to younger people and sharing commons and, and commoners stories through film productions and, and media pr productions. It's a very brief snapshot of what's going on, but if you'd like to hear more, please do get in touch and my contact details uh, are available just on this slide here. That's all for me, Julia. Thank you very much, Alan. And uh, it's excellent to see the work going forward on this. We have an area group in Cumbria that's bringing together the partners in Cumbria. And if anyone, as Alan says, anyone wants to know more, please take down details. We will be sending out the slides after the session, probably tomorrow. So everybody will get a, a copy of the slide so don't worry too much about writing it all down but Alan you can also get um, Alan's details off the Foundation for Common Land website and thank you to all those who were involved in the development phase as well um, because that's made this delivery phase possible. So one of our projects and one of what we're doing nationally is uh, across through our Upland Commons is called Getting Ready for ELM. For those who don't know, ELM is Environmental Land Management, and it's the umbrella of schemes which DEFRA will be providing to give effect to their policy, public money for public goods. We're all really aware um, that huge changes in the air. If we could move on to the next slide, please, Alan. So we've structured um, this talk around what we do know what we don't know and what we can do now. And there are inevitably a huge uncertainties at the moment. And the only thing that is certain that there is lots of change and there's lots of uncertainty. So that is the world we live in. And the question is, is how do we look after our own businesses and our own communities um, oh. as we go forward? If people could please go on mute, that would be great. Um, Susie, perhaps you could mute everybody. I right, unmute myself. Next slide, please. So the first part is what we do know. Um, and uh, that we do know a little bit more now than we did a couple of weeks ago. So there was an announcement on the 2nd of December, and that's really what's prompted these talks is the announcement around the Sustainable Farming Incentive for 2022. Next slide, please. And just to show you where this fits in. So we had last uh, two weeks ago, the SFI 22, the Moreland Introductory Standard announced. And this, the Sustainable Farming Incentive is one of three components of ELM, of the new components of ELM. Um, we also have local nature recovery and landscape recovery. SFI is being introduced in phases. Some of you may have already been involved in the pilot that's just been launched. Um, we have the, the standards on um, for arable and for improved grassland and moorland introductory standard were announced 
two weeks ago. And then in 2024, we expect the Moreland Intermediate and Advanced Standard. And this evening, we're really focusing on how the Moreland Standard is going to work on commons. Local nature recovery, if you think about it, probably as a HLS countryside stewardship replacement and landscape recovery is about big scale um, change over large areas of over 500 hectares. So it may well be suitable for commons. And we are, we just heard this week that the Foundation for Common Land has received um, a, a contract to run a test and trial on landscape recovery in the Mulfans and the New Forest. So we're going to be focusing some work uh, on those areas of common land in the future. So next slide, please. So in terms of common schemes and where we are at the moment, where and in the position at the moment where your common may be a no scheme, in which case you'll be receiving BPS, you can apply for SFI 22 and you may be eligible to apply for local nature recovery or landscape recovery pilots. You may be an HLS, just ending an HLS or in an HLS rollover, in which case you'll still be receiving BPS and SFI. Um, you'll be able to apply for SFI 22 from next year. Or finally, um, you may be in a countryside stewardship scheme agreement. And it's similarly BPS and SFI 22. So the, the key thing about SFI 22 is that you'll be able to stack it with your existing schemes. So that's the, the position we're in. Um, next slide, please. And as I said um, earlier, when people come, the SFI um, 22, you know, the Foundation for Common Land, I should stress, is a charity and our main aim is to uh, improve and protect and conserve common land and the system of commoning. And we're here to help common land be better managed and to help ensure that commoning continues. And I often say to people that a common land without commoning is no longer common land in my books. I know there are lots of abandoned commons and they are still registered common land, but it is that living breathing activity that takes place that distinguishes commons and many for, for, for me anyway. So we, um, and I should also add that as an organization, we've been working really closely with DEFRA and we've been working, and many of you will know about the test and trial, which we've been undertaking together with the Federation of Cumbrian Commoners. And I think it's fair to say that many of us are extremely disappointed with the offer. Um, we feel it's a lower, ambition, low offer scheme, i.e. paying a small amount of money for a, a, a scheme that does, isn't over demanding and it is therefore so much more. There would, could have been opportunities for so much more. At the same time, we made that very clear to DEFRA, but at the same time, the money is available, the opportunities are there, and the, we all know that BPS is going to be halved by um, 2024. So currently on Moorland, it's £64 per hectare. By 2024, it'll be £32 um, per hectare and going down. And the last BPS payment will be in 2027. What, what DEFRA was seeking to do is, is with the SFI 22, what they're seeking to do is to ensure that people get to understand the assets on their common better. So not about the livestock, but the assets of the soil and the vegetation and how they can use those to deliver public goods. There are no land management actions required. You're being asked to collect data and plan future opportunities. And the total payment is low. So our advice is that we all will require a really slick system for delivering this. <clears throat> so we want it to work really well. And through the Getting Ready for ELM project, the Foundation for Common Land with partners across England will be working through workshops to make sure that to support you in developing a system that works for your common we're not we don't provide advice we're not advisors but it's it's seen what opportunities what tools are available so next slide please so i'm sure many of you will know by now that the indicative payment is £6.45 per hectare for Moorland. There will be an additional £148 per agreement. Now, this is for whether you're on a common or not a common. 
So it might be that you have an allotment that's moorland that's 20 hectares or 50 hectares, you will get the six, you can get the six pounds 45 and the 148 pounds. So if we look at the total 1000 hectares receive 6598 pounds per year. In addition, there will be a, an additional payment for commons, we're expecting that the reason they haven't announced the additional payment yet is that we were um, very concerned that it was a flat rate, whether the common was 50 hectares or 5000 hectares, and we felt that was inappropriate didn't reflect the, the amount of work involved and. We know that DEFRA are working on that and looking at how they can make perhaps a tiered system of payments and to reflect the real work in putting together a commons agreement. <coughs> These will be three year schemes. So people are signing up for three years and there are three elements to SFI 22. So the first element is to verify and record soil and vegetation. The second element B is to evaluate the public goods potential. And the third element is identifying what actual opportunities, what you could do on your common. So moving on to the next, the next slide. And I've seen, already seen in the chat, there's um, Jim or Kirsty has said that they say it barely worth it. I, I completely understand where people are coming from that point of view, but please bear with me um, and let's go through this. And what's important is that when you think about this scheme, do not think about it as a replacement for BPS. It is not a replacement for BPS. Anyone who looks at it in that way is going to be deeply, deeply disappointed. What we're suggesting is that instead it requires a mindset shift. We say is that there is the train of BPS is going, that is out, and there's the new train of environmental land management. And what we're doing is using this stage to prepare ourselves. So when you go to the train station to get a train, you need to get to the train station, you need to buy a ticket, and then you get on the train. And you're not committed until you're on the train. It's unadvisable to jump off once on the train as consequences. But at the moment, we're at the stage of getting to the station and buying the ticket. You come here, you're learning about what the opportunities are. And undertaking SFI, Moreland Introductory Standards, is a bit like the um, is a little bit like buying the ticket. So that's the stage we're at. You are not committed to undertake any activities. You can still manage your common as, um, it, as you are at the moment. So in terms of A, so this is just giving you a little bit more detail. This information is available on gov.uk. I've synthesized it and there is more detail there and there will be more guidance issued in um, sort of March, April time. The scheme will be available to open in approximate well we don't know when spring summer and there'll be a 10 week window for applying and um, the application process we expect to be pretty straightforward um, it's obviously the delivery will happen after then from sort of autumn onwards so in terms of what you're being asked to do in terms of the recording so if your common was a thousand hectares then we're being asked to undertake one recording one sort of stopping point look every 10 hectares so that is looking at measuring the wetness and depth of peat. And because we're online rather than face-to-face, -face, when I've been doing this in Shropshire and Dartmoor, I've done a little jump up and down. So what you're gonna do is jump up and down on the, you get to your point and you say, is it wet? Is it mineral soil? Is it more likely to be a peat soil? You don't have to dig a hole, you don't have to take a core, but you see whether measure its wetness and guidance will be given. Then you will measure the depth of the peat if there is any there take a photograph of the vegetation at that point and record the condition of that vegetation and guidance will be given. And you're to do this annually. So each year you go to a different place. So over time, you will get a, um, be creating a map across your common over the three years. We can move to the next slide, please. So what do we need in order to undertake this? It's gonna be, um, the key is to get really well set up. We're going to need a map of your common, a more detailed map than that. That's, um, but that gives you material. We need a map. We need a smartphone in order to take the photographs. So the photographs are geotagged. Anyone who has a smartphone, doesn't matter if it's Android or um, iPhone or Microsoft or whoever it's from, any other provider, they usually have geotag, so location. So you turn on that and when you take a photo, you will have, a, it'll tell you later on, it, when you upload it, it will can tell you where it's taken from. 
you'll need some poles, some bamboo poles for measuring peat. You can use a sort of more a bit like a chimney sweep rod if you like. But if you take some um, bamboo poles, do take several because they sometimes break. A, a sheet for, for assessing which plants are there. And we're expecting DEFRA talking about having photographs to help with that and a way of recording the information. And we're going to be looking at um, either doing on, it can be either on paper or maybe an app to make it easier to collect the data. So you're not then having to re-enter it later. So moving on to the next slide. Thank you. So section B is looking at evaluating the public goods potential. So what we are doing here is using the results for that you've collected in A, so from each stopping point, is then to identify which public goods you can deliver. So for instance, it might be that you've got archeological site, it might be that um, you've got a, a peat bog or a valley mire, it might be that you've got um, uh, you know, particular biodiversity, um, that, that, that that's your, what you're offering. And maybe you've got particular birds you found, whatever it is, identify that and, and then look at the condition of those. Uh, and that will be reviewed and annually and updated. And when we look at the public goods, we've traditionally had there been sort of six baskets of public goods, biodiversity or nature, carbon storage, water, access, heritage and landscape. Uh, unfortunately, uh, um, well, I say unfortunately, from my, perspe my perspective, I feel all these are really important and absolutely critical and should all be funded. Uh, DEFRA um, have taken the policy decision, or the government, I should say, have taken the policy decision that they're really only focusing on the top three, biodiversity, carbon storage and water. At the moment, they're, they're not focusing money on access, heritage and landscape. There are though a lot of bodies, both from farming and from um, the environmental groups, who feel that it's absolutely critical that money goes towards access, heritage and landscape. And um, we absolutely support that. And so if you think that all of these should be funded, then please write to your MP. It's really important that MPs, because this is a political decision, it's really important that MPs, it doesn't matter whether you voted for your MP or not, write to your MP, give them your views and make sure and ask them to ask a question of the minister. Could we move on to the next slide, please? <coughs> so the question is, what do you do with all this data? And what we've been, um, testing out in our test and trial is working with an organization called the land app some of you may have heard of them and the land app is um, a community interest company and they are providing a service to farmers and land managers um, for mapping what they've got on your land commons as you may know are quite tricky from a mapping point of view because when you go on the rural payments land view you don't see the common um, because it's all to do with how the allocation of EPS entitlements goes and it's been really hard to, to view that but we're now getting to the position we've been working really closely with the RPA and we're now in the position where we can um, we've been doing us some tests and we hope before long to mainstream that for every um, common uh, where you have an SBI if you're in a scheme or even if you were in a scheme for instance where a new ELS you will have an SBI you click this red button import from the Royal Payments Agency it will a box will pop up and you type your SBI and then imports the land parcels. This is Derwent Common, um, which has a high level stewardship scheme. And you can see um, the blue lines are the land parcels. You can also see the land covers. And we're here, it's a map showing Bracken. So part of our Upland Commons, um, the commoners have been working together with Alan and with their um, land agent, Nick, who I think is on the call and they've been um, mapping uh, areas with, where they'd like to undertake bracket management and that's then helping them to have a negotiation uh, to negotiate their HLS rollover and look at how they can deliver better grazing more for nature and, um, and look after the site. So if we could move on to the next slide I should say this is free to use there's no charge for, for doing this We're just using the, the background data is using the OS free data on this. There are charges there for, for some of the services, but to create these maps, there isn't. The great thing about the land app is that you can share it with many, many people. Um, so you can add in people uh, to, uh, 
to view or you can add them in as editing so everybody on your common can see this. So once you've um, got the, the, bait, the, the field parcels in there, the next thing is that you may remember under A, we suggest you take a photo of the vegetation uh, of where you are. And this is an example of how you can upload a photo. So if you look at where it says Bracken down here, you click on the three dots and it says upload photo. I just dragged a photo from my desktop, popped it in the box and there's the photo. And you can see the little camera here. So it's literally a, you know, a 10 second job. Um, drag it there and it shows where that photo is. And then a little box pops up. It has a picture of the photo um, and then you can, um, you can write details about it. And you can also add documents. So for instance, if this was around the woodland at Keskadale, you could add in documents about it. You might have had a survey might have been undertaken. This is a uh, um, Keskadale woodlands here, um, which are a, a area of important um, upland Atlantic wood, um, oak woodland. And so information can be put in there. So if we can move on to the next slide, please. So after um, that, so that's B, you've, you've logged everything about the details about uh, the, all the public goods, um, you've recorded them, you go through that for all, if, if it was a thousand hectares, you would do that a hundred uh, times across your common. And then you would, um, next stage is identifying opportunities. So for instance, as well as Keskadale um, Oaks, there's another oak woodland on, on Derwent, and it might be that you look at that one and say, well, this one isn't fenced off. Should we be uh, either fencing it off or should we be looking at no fencing it off? Isn't actually um, the right thing to do, but maybe we want to do a bit more planting and do, you can look at opportunities. You can look at bracken management, for instance, you could put your bracken management proposal into, into the plan, looking at producing um, a summary of all the opportunities and guidance and training will be provided by DEFRA and also through our Upland Commons, we will be doing um, more training as well. But as I um, uh, you know, stress, this is, uh, you know, you, you'll go through this process bit by bit, year by year. And at this stage, it's just really enabling you to have more information about your common. And for me, I'm, I always feel that, you know, information is knowledge. Knowledge gives you power and power puts you in a position to sell the assets that are on on your land more effectively so if other people have the knowledge and the data they're going to be in a stronger position and this is the opportunity that SFI Moreland introductory standard is giving you is to understand what's on your common better to hold that data in a digital form to be able to share it to be able to plan and then in the future you may be saying you may be in the same way with selling your sheep. You may decide to sell at one mart, you may decide to sell another mart, you may decide to sell dead weight, you may decide to sell your stock live um, to a private buyer. You've got opportunities. It's similar with carbon, with biodiversity. There will be opportunities in the future, not just through ELM. We could move on to the next slide, please. And um, so in terms of helping identify these opportunities, so one, this is a bit that does cost money. So it's looking at the maps, it can take a long time to work out how many hectares of different types of habitat are on your common. But there is information about habitat networks that does exist. There are these lots of national databases. And the great thing is that in terms of the, um, the land app, it's got lots of these data sets that are pre-populated and they effectively cut it by the area you've chosen by your land parcels. So you're not having to work out what's on your bit of land. So you can run a report. Um, it's, I did this when I was on a train journey, it didn't require very heavy internet. It, um, I clicked through which features I wanted, took um, about five minutes and the report cost 14 pounds 59. Um, to, to generate that and you can you probably can't see because it may be a bit small but for instance here habitat networks it says um, upland heathland upland flushes blanket bog uh, lowland fens ancient woodland here um, it, so there's lots of information here so upland heath is the majority um, so you know, there's the information there about the peat status here shallow peat soils it says 1305 hectares deep peat soils 174 hectares, tells you about the triple size, tells you about the scheduled ancient monuments. The report is much, much bigger. I've just shown a snapshot here. 
we could mo move on. Um, so in terms of how this money will be received, um, there's still... Sorry, if whoever's talking, could they just go on mute, please? So in terms of uh, how the money is contributed, the money will be paid to the association. So in the future, all money for commons will be paid to the association. So your association is really important. How you, you're governing your association, how you're distributing, your those payments how you manage those payments so at the moment your people will be familiar with countryside stewardship hls and previously uels coming to your association monies from the sustainable farming incentive local nature recovery and landscape recovery will all come to your association so getting together getting on well with your neighbors is absolutely critical associations of course have a lot of other benefits aside from uh, managing scheme money but this is an area where we'll be focusing on the governance. Um, it is an area where uh, we have been working incredibly closely with DEFRA and um, a couple of weeks ago, I was um, deeply concerned as were many others about the proposals being put forward for Commons. They have made some significant changes before publication. And in particular, we're in the position now where land law, land owner consent is not uh, required. By, to enter the scheme. So you may remember that for CS and HLS, you need the land owner consent. Um, what we're, everyone's been advised is to work collaboratively with all those with a legal interest on in the common, whether they're an owner or commoners, whether they're graziers or non-graziers, everybody needs to be notified that you're proposing to enter into a scheme. So your owner may really be able to help, they may have data available, they may have resources available, they may be able to support you in this process but there is not, uh, uh, you know, there, there's not that requirement for consent. In terms of the internal agreement, you'll, many of you will be familiar with producing an internal agreement that you all sign. This is only a three-year scheme, so we're suggesting rather than an internal agreement, a complicated internal agreement to the deed, there'd be effectively a template, a contract, which you would use, um, that you would effectively be able to, to fill in much more easily, just um, it'd be constrained in which boxes you could change that in um, comments have already been made about what was how you know that it's a very small payment and it's clearly up, each common is going to be in a different situation recognizing it's a very small payment i suggest that commons and it's only for three years i would suggest that commons decide whether they actually want to distribute any of this money there will be costs involved in doing the work collecting the data you can do the work yourself. You can pay one or two of the commoners to do the work. You wouldn't need to in, you know, use uh, an ecologist or land agent or environmentalist. You can do that work yourself, but then you know, clearly not. it's not sensible. If there are 10 commoners on a thousand hectares. You're not going to all train up 10 people and each to do 10 stops. Well, you could, but that would seem a, uh, probably not the most efficient way of doing it. But what we'd suggest is that you think about holding onto that money in order to provide a fund for cash flowing other works that you may need. You may be aware that a lot of uh, grants, whether it's FIPL or other things require match funding in terms of capital works that are required, you often have to, you usually have to do the works and then claim the money back again. So what we're suggesting is that you may want to consider not, not dividing the money up because it is a very small amount of money that's unlikely to be transformational to anyone's business. Um, you know, for instance, that money, six and a half thousand pounds, if it's a thousand hectares, 10 commoners, 650 pounds, if that amount of money per year is going to be transformational to anyone's business, probably their business has pretty severe problems. Um, and I think you know, looking at how the common, how you're going to manage the common going forward is something um, really to consider. Also, as we all know, dividing money up produces a lot of stress within a community and takes a lot of time. Um, so this is why we're, we're putting this forward and we'd be really interested to hear your views in the facilitation group, um, in the groups um, when we're going to breakout rooms. We go to the next slide, please. So in terms of governance, as I said, we're looking at a three-year agreement, a simpler form of contract, 
you will RPA will be delivering uh, this scheme, so you will need to register the beneficiaries and everybody on the on the rural payment service. Clearly, if you're not giving any of the money out, then you simply just need the Commons Association on there. And as with the uh, um, current scheme, it'll be the chairman or administrator who will sign the, sign the agreement with the RPA on behalf RPA acting on behalf of DEFRA. So as we say, the internal agreement will looking potentially much something much simpler, much slicker. So going, uh, we could go on now, please. So in terms of what we don't know, what we don't know <coughs> is um, we don't know there will be. We do know there are going to be new countryside stewardship payment rates for the annual payments, not for the capital works, but for the annual payments from January 22, and they will announce these in the new year. We also are putting quite a lot of pressure on them to up the six pounds um, 45 per hectare, and those are being reviewed at the moment. So we're waiting um, here, but it may be those of you who are doing HLS rollovers may want to look again to see whether the new CS payment rates um, make a shift from HLS rollover to CS more attractive, giving you more uh, security going forward. Um, as I said, I don't know what the rates are, so I can't say whether that's going to be a good idea or not. It will very much depend on your individual circumstances. We don't know what the overall agricultural budget is after 2024. So the 3.1 um, billion for the UK, it will equate to about just over 2 billion for England. That is, um, that's only fixed for this parliament. There's a general desire, you know, why are we spending money on agriculture and the environment? Um, that question is being asked. I mean, that's not, me asking the question, that is a question asked repeatedly by Treasury. Again, if you think that it's really important to be looking after our countryside and producing good quality, sustainable food for the British public, then I suggest you make your views known to anybody who has influence over the current government. There's a real concern that that budget could well go down. And also if we don't take up these schemes, then the Treasury will say, they don't need to be spending the money. They're also very much looking at private companies to come in and fill the gap from government so that instead of them government providing money, it'll be EasyJet and Burger King who will pay money to offset their carbon emissions by buying into um, making payments and deals with landowners. My view is it's public service and that those, as with the health service, as with the libraries, as with schools, those are best funded through the government. Just so you're aware, that 3 billion is only 0.4% of all government expenditure. It is tiny. What we also don't know is what options and standards will be for SFI 24 and for local nature recovery. So they're working on that. So for the moorland for intermediate and advanced, and I know lots of people from the Federation and from other commoners groups around the country have been working with DEFRA on that. It's very much still up for grabs. And we're very pleased that DEFRA have brought in some additional expertise uh, to support them in that process. And um, we should say that certainly DEFRA are on this uh, call, uh, on this meeting this evening, and we're pleased to have them with us. I think the RPA might be here as well. What we also don't know, as I mentioned before, is what support there'll be for Commons governance and administration. There will be some support, but we don't know yet. Um, it's we're very much working with DEFRA on this and, um, you know, how to make a scheme that's simple to administer, but also recognises the complexities of commons. So moving on, please, we're nearly getting to the end. So this is really what can you do now? It is a hugely challenging time and anybody who um, is talking to their neighbours in the Mart, who's meeting neighbours anywhere, who will know how challenging it is. We know that clearly livestock prices are good, but countering those, the cost of inputs, the cost of feed, the cost of fuel is going up dramatically. So um, what can you do now is I would say the first thing um, you can do is if your common is not in a scheme at all, do reconsider a countryside stewardship agreement as well as a sustainable farming incentive. This is particularly with the new, once the new figures come out, there should be another round of applying for countryside stewardship in March. And so have a look at that and see if, it, if the sums add up now, whether it's a good option for you, for your, the commoners in your, in your um, community. Also for each of us looking at our individual farm, how can we increase profitability, which generally means how do we reduce costs to increase our net income? There are 
lot resilience sessions being run by the farmer network and across England. I know there are people attending here from other areas who weren't able to get to our face to face sessions. So do look at how how do you take a really you know, clear and objective look at your own business. You currently, if you're only getting tax accounts from your accountant, ask them for management accounts, maybe look at uh, uh, a, a, a bookkeeping system. You can do it on a spreadsheet, you can do it on a, on a pen and paper. You, the key is to look at where are your costs, what are you spending your money on, and where is your income coming from. In terms of preparing for the future, um, what we would suggest you do is look and practice with the mapping package. Um, there are, as I say, there's the land app, there's QGIS, which is a much more sophisticated package, but more complicated. There, um, uh, there are also other packages, um, field margin and others as well. So do look at what, uh, um, so that you, you get used to doing that. Um, and then you can collect the data year after year and build up um, a package. And it also means that other people, you can have multiple people contributing do collect baseline data. There will be data available, particularly if you're in an AONB or national park, there may be that those organizations hold data. It might be that your landowner holds data as well, and you know, they will be able to help you. Natural England may well hold data, but a lot of this data that um, is available, there are, it's a lot of data available, including all FEP surveys, they're available on online, and we'll be running some, um, providing some advice on how to get, download that data. And finally, do make sure your Commons contact lists are up to date. As I said, you will need to notify everybody who has a legal interest in your Common um, about going into a scheme, whether it's SFI or future schemes as well. So maybe get another copy of the Commons register, check through um, who is coming. You, you have to make reasonable efforts, it's, but uh, make sure that you have that list available. So moving on, um, please. That is the end. So we are now, um, everyone is free to get in touch uh, with ourselves through our website. Uh, and we're really keen to hear from you. In the background here this evening is Susie Hodgson. Susie is our administrator. She's based in Ambleside three days a week. And um, Susie, you can either ring the office there or you can get in touch by email and we'll do our best to help you. I should say we don't provide professional advice to individual commerce, but we're here to provide guidance and signposting and support where we can. So I think now we're moving to, um, Viv, are you going to explain about the, uh, what we're doing next in terms of the breakout rooms? Sorry, <clears throat> just to unmute myself. Well, it's great to see so many people here. Um, this next session is, it's actually over to you. It's your session. Um, you've heard what Julia said. There's a huge amount of information there. And we thought it would be good. We we're going to be um, divided up sort of randomly, fairly randomly into eight breakout groups. Each group will have a facilitator who's a committee member of the Federation of Cumbria Commoners. We have 15 minutes to have a discussion on what you've heard. Um, and it's, I've seen some very interesting um, reflections in the chat already. Um, we've got a sort of series of questions to guide you through, and then we're going to have um, a feedback session at the end of that. So hopefully it'll become all obvious. You don't really have to do anything. You will be put in a, a breakout group, so just sit tight and um, I will see you back in 15, 20 minutes. <laughs>